There we go. Good afternoon. Thank you, Jeff, uh, for a kind introduction. Uh, thank you to the organizers. Thank you to our French colleagues who are hosting us so well. Uh, you should be really proud of this meeting. I think it's an enormous success and an incredible feat. And I'm humbled to be here, uh, to be honest, to speak in front of you and to follow such a, a high bar that has been set in most of, of this conference. So I'll try to do, uh, to do my best. Uh, I'll start, what, what I wanna do here is, and I've been kind of uh, going over several panels and discussing, and we have a feeling at this day of the meeting that almost everything has been said, right? Uh, what I wanna do is reflect a little bit on the advances that we have done, how far we have come on addressing many, many of these issues. I and put that in the context of the situation, the global situation that we are uh, nowadays. And in doing so, what I try to do is to look ahead and try to bring forward those wicked problems that we have to face during the next 20 years to sustain the advances that we have done and to face new advances that where we have not addressed. And I'll try to do both to call attention to some of those advances and to bring those that have been in the shadows of the spotlight uh, and have not, I think, received the attention that uh, it deserves for the role it has in shaping our landscapes. This is an image of the world that we live in. It's a moving target. Uh, we live in a time of accelerated change, and we live in a time of high connectivity. And what are the implications of that? So on the one hand, you have improving conditions on the one side, if I had time to explain those graphs on the left, and you have pressures mounting on the other side. As an academic, when you try to understand these changes, and in a region where I work, the Amazon, you are always reflecting on what we understand is overwhelmed by the changes that take place. So the analytical tools that we have, the solutions that we have, is suddenly overwhelmed by the changes that happen around them. And we're very badly equipped as scholars and practitioners to cope with complexity and accelerated changes. And I want to get to the ground, to the Amazon, to reflect on issues that I think speak to many other regions. I think the Amazon is not only a keystone region for the global environment, but it's an emblematic region of the development problems that we have in many places. And what the, the, the lessons that we get from regions like that, I think will help us to reflect on problems that, that we have uh, elsewhere. So I want to look at the shadows of the spotlight here and look at some of the underlying social processes that are there. The governance issues that are related to our property rights. How our property rights have evolved to deal with complex and connected landscapes or not. Uh, the nature of collective action. How ourselves as communities have been able to cope and to move beyond our territorial thinking and our local thinking into cope with connections and issues that affect us from the distance. And finally, what I think is the elephant in the room and the least addressed issues in a context like this, which is the urban issues, both from the perspective of vulnerability to climate change and on the perspective of how it shapes the landscapes in the regions where we work. I don't think we have given enough attention to the connections and, and importance of urban air to that. Here's an example of areas where we, we advanced in many ways. I think during the past 20 years in the Amazon is emblematic of that, we have been able to cope with the expansion of agricultural frontiers by creating a variety of institutional arrangements that protect the rights of local populations and serve as a buffer to deforestation. It's an enormous advance. In a region like the Amazon, in few years, 40% of the region has been set aside or in some form of arrangement that address those issues. That approach has a limitation. And we see the limitation now very clearly. I'm calling it islands of landscape governance. What indigenous peoples and local communities have been successfully addressing the boundaries of their reserves to buffer the pressure from the outside when possible. Those governance arrangements that function well at one level 
are not enough to deal with problems that come from the outside. Pollution comes through watersheds. Smoke comes through the air. Pressures come through the borders. We need to think about moving to a multi-level governance that put those areas in the context of changing landscapes. So not to lose the advances we have made so much in the previous years, we need to move in and move a step ahead to address the pressures that we now face in this context. You can look at another region in Brazil where we have is a coevolution of many kinds of property regimes next to each other and overlapping with each other. Those property regimes have evolved to function well with particular types of resources, but they do not address flows. They do not address other kinds of commons that are related to ecosystem services. So you see the pressures from the outside. And those pressures reflect not only economic pressures, but they reflect the way people get attached and are attached to landscapes. For indigenous peoples who have a landscape within, that is part of their identity, that is part of the way of life. For people who want to get the primary productivity out of the landscape above. And for the humongous pressures of mining that has a landscape below. Those property regimes are now challenged to find cross-border governance, to find ways and commitments in which we have a common contract to deal with the problems that transcend the boundaries that we are able to govern so well. People are reacting. In enforcement, in, in first-person enforcement, as the news from the Washington Post shows recently, which is not a new issue in the Amazon, but is becoming a more pressing issue of the Amazon of protecting your borders with guns. And you have other examples where people have been proactive in trying to reach out and find other forms of collective action and social capital that address those connectivities that we now face. But you have on the other side an elephant in the room. The Amazon is an urban region. Urban networks and urban growth are shaping the landscape today, are shaping the flow of people, and will shape the landscape in the next 20 years. It's the flow and connections, physical, social, economic, and cultural, that will define the Amazon and many other parts of the world in the years to come. The face of urban conditions in the Amazon is the face of climate change vulnerability that we have not addressed enough. In this region, which is the Amazon estuary, the vast majority of the population there, and that accounts for about a million and a half to two million people, live in conditions of vulnerability to flood, vulnerability to violence, not to say, uh, lack of sewage, uh, lack of, of uh, good water, that impact not only them, but impact upstreams and downstreams. And that's the situation that we need to face. We cannot uh, treat landscapes as isolated, that urban reality in which people move between those landscapes. And that uh, really the mass of the vulnerability to climate change are, con are concentrated. That creates different dimensions for collective action. And here you have a situation where you have the fishermen on the right who until not long ago had a collective action problem to deal with other fishermen. It was a problem of dealing with the technology of fishing, a problem of dealing with how much we should catch. That same fisherman is now subsumed under a condition of pollution and a condition of urban sprawl, a condition that is much beyond the collective action mechanisms in the form uh, of agreements that, that we have uh, learned to do. So the same social norms, the same rules that we develop at a local scale between people that are more or less similar with similar goals are not enough to capture the problems that come from the outside. They're basically subsumed under conditions that have no power to change. The people who, had, who use the water and depend deeply on the water uh, and used to know where to go for a bath, used to know which tide 
would clean the surroundings so you could use the water, are now confronted with urban pollution, both solid and, and organic, and confronted with industrial spills like the one on the bottom of Kowloon, which have become, become a common occurrence in this part of the Amazon. They are part of a landscape. It's a landscape largely defined by urban areas. But most of, although there's all these accelerated changes, most of our social institutions, most of our forms of collective actions is still work at a small territorial level. It's a different challenge, cognitive and this of social interaction. To conclude, or to get to conclude in just this few minutes, we should make no mistake. Landscapes in the next 20 years will be shaped by the coevolution of urban areas, agrarian systems, and all these kinds of reserves. And we need to develop different kinds of thinking. We need to develop complex system perspectives to cope with a world in accelerated change. And understand the implications of the solutions that we put that sometimes create structures that are not adaptable to new realities. So just some final remarks, and maybe we'll pick on some of, the, of those issues as we, as we sit for a discussion. We have made a advance in governance systems to protect many of our territories. We need to think in a landscape way about bridging institutions, to put emphasis in ways of bridging, not of separating landscapes. I think the question of funding of climate change that comes so often here, to me, it's less of a question of where it's coming from, but more of a question of where is it going? What are the priorities that will allow us to apply those funds in a way that make an impact, that make a difference, and that make an incremental improvement over time? A region like the Amazon, you hear all the time that, oh, we had that before. You know, we had that incredible plan before, and they were abandoned. It's incremental changes that will make a difference in the life of people. And how we apply those funds and where we apply those funds will help us to set a process of continuous adaptation to change instead of uh, 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 a static perspective that we think we're going to solve our problems. And we have an enormous role in that as academics, as practitioners, to rethink the limits of our conceptual approaches, rethinking the limits of our analytical frameworks to actually cope with the complexity of problems that our concepts and our disciplines are handicapped to do. And with that, I'll leave it to Robin to continue this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eduardo. And I think Eduardo took us straight to the heart of what for me is perhaps the single biggest problem, this whole, whole question of realigning our institutions to deal with the issues. And there's been no collusion between us, but his, Eduardo's remarks about cities in the Amazon reflect exactly my observations on the cities of Southeast Asia, that if you want to understand the future scenarios for the forests, you have to understand what's going to happen in the urban environment. There are very close.